What is impermanent loss? So as DeFi gets ready to come to the XRP ledger, uh, we're going to go over a couple of the key concepts and terms that you should understand before you make any decisions to participate. Hey, welcome to the show. Molly here. It's been a while since I did a video of this nature where we're going to go over some concepts around DeFi today and specifically this idea of impermanent loss. Uh, the reason I'm bringing this up now is there's been some chatter that uh, DeFi type exchanges will be coming to the XRP ledger. And I actually went down this whole avenue a couple of years ago when I was pretty actively uh, participating in DeFi exchanges on some other blockchains, specifically Co uh, the Cosmos blockchain and Osmosis, which is where I kind of spent the most of my time kind of learning about this, these ideas of liquidity pools, as well as some other kind of newer block, uh, Binance has some. And after the kind of crash of Terra and the beginning of the bear market, honestly, I sort of stepped out of that world. That's when I discovered XRP and kind of been playing around in this sandbox since then. There hasn't really been much DeFi stuff to do for us. So these ideas I kind of like put aside and, you know, but now it is time to bring them back out and talk about what exactly happens on an AMM, which is an automated market maker. And if you've ever exchanged assets on something like SushiSwap, PancakeSwap or Osmosis, those are AMMs. And the difference between an AMM and another type of exchange is that everything is pretty much automated on AMM. There is no order book. You aren't sort of seeing all of these offers that are being um, kind of matched with buyers and sellers. You, like if you ever go onto KuCoin or MEXC Global, you, that is a, you know, an exchange where there's an order book. These are done differently. And, you know, I'm not an expert on trading by any means. I just found this technology very interesting. And it was actually a little bit of a challenge at first to kind of grasp what was going on in liquidity pools, liquidity pools, because I had never been a part of this type of world. And so because I had to go through the process of learning it, I can now re-explain it to all of you. Uh, now, I'm making some assumptions that what is going to come to the XRP ledger functions similarly to the exchanges that I use on Osmosis and Binance, for example. I don't know that for a fact. Um, I know that these concepts make a lot of sense and are likely to be applied. But, you know, as these tools get rolled out in other places, I'm going to pay attention to see if anything is different. But the main idea here is that if I go to an exchange, I'm generally looking to swap one and we'll use the word coin and token interchangeably in digital asset. Like for all intents and purposes today, those are kind of functionally the same thing. I know that they have different definitions relative to being a, a blockchain native token or not. So whatever. For this purposes, we're going into the concepts around how liquidity pools work and what, what happens or what are you doing or offering if you are a participant uh, by providing liquidity to one of these pools. All right, so let's say you decide to go to, or just use Osmosis. You decide to go to Osmosis and you want to earn some yield from your tokens. Uh, most of the pools, not all of them, but most of them are generally two assets. Some of them have three. We're just not going to go there right now. So let's just say we got two assets. One asset will be, you know, token, we'll just use Osmo, the Osmo token that was on the Osmosis blockchain. You have the Osmo token, and then I have another token like Atom, which is the native Cosmo blockchain token. And because Osmo is the native token for the Osmosis blockchain, it makes a lot of sense to use that in liquidity pairs. And what I mean by that is, let's say on this blockchain, there was a hundred different tokens that could be exchanged. Liquidity pools have two tokens in them. And if I wanted to have the option to exchange any of those 100 tokens for the 99 that are, are not the one I'm trading, if you think about the math of combinations, that's a lot of combinations. So if these liquidity pools are set up as individual sort of entities, you would need so much money, so much liquidity 
to be able to have a combination of every single token pair. I mean, this is one of the cool things about ODL, uh, Ripple's product, is that there you don't have to have a pair for every single like sovereign currency to be exchanged in global trade. Everything goes through this one asset. And it works like that in a lot of DeFi exchanges. So on Osmosis, for example, if I had Adam and I wanted to have Juno, these are just random tokens. You don't need to know, be familiar with them. There would need to be that liquidity pair, but we, we don't want to have to have a combination of every single asset. So what often happens is first you swap Adam for Osmo. That becomes like the bridge asset. And then I swap Osmo for Juno. And that way, the, the exchange itself only needs to have a pair between every asset and Osmo. Sometimes this is done with stable coins. We're just using Osmo as an example. So this drastically reduces the number of liquidity pairs that you need in order to have a healthy, thriving exchange. So let's say you have some, now when you participate in a liquidity pool, you get a cut of the transaction fees. And that's kind of how you earn your yield. So let's say you decide you want to put in some Osmo and some Atom. The way that actually works is you have to have a certain ratio of those assets and the liquidity pools, usually they tell you that. So let's say it's one to one for argument's sake. So I'm going to put in a hundred Osmos and a hundred Atoms. Usually it's one to one based on value and it's unlikely that those two assets are the same in value. So it probably be, would be more likely like 300 of one and 100 of another. What happens is you combine those, like you deposit both of those and you get an LP token, liquidity pool token back. And this, the way I like to look at it is this represents the share of the liquidity pool that you have. So if this liquidity pool had a million dollars worth and I put in, I have to do this math, man. So if I have a million dollars, I'll save $100,000 worth in the pool and I put in $1,000, that's one one hundredth. So I get 1% of this pool. This is key because the thing that surprised me at first, because I hadn't ever done this kind of thing before, was that if I put in you know, 300 tokens, I assumed that when I go to take them out, like I'm going to get back what I put in. This is the key concept to understand and ties into this idea of impermanent loss. When you participate in liquidity pool, you are putting value in, tokens in, and you're getting an ownership stake of that pool. Think of it like a percentage. So if I own 1% of that pool on you know, June 3rd, when I go to pull out, let's say it's October 3rd, I'm going to get whatever 1% of that pool is. But the thing that happens is the value of assets changes. And in many cases, it can change a lot. And so the arbitrator, ar <laughs> the arbitrage, arbitrageurs, I guess that's the word, the arbitrageurs uh, help maintain these liquidity pools by buying and selling based on whether or not any of the assets of the prices go up or down in value. So what this means is that if you had these two assets, let's Osmo and Adam, for example, and let's say the price of Adam goes up 5x, the ratio of the assets within this pool is going to change because one is now considerably more valuable than another. And that means that when I go to pull out my assets from the liquidity pool, I'm not going to get back what I put in initially. I'm still going to get 1% because that's what I own. But because the, the ratio of the two assets has changed because the value of one went up a lot relative to the other, uh, what I get back is that 1% is going to be different. Now, this idea of impermanent loss is important because it is one of the sort of financial risks. So if this one asset, my atom, let's say I'm really bullish on atom. It's like the one that I believe in, but I want to earn some yield on it because I got a whole bunch of it. So if I had a thousand atom, to my name and I put all of them in a liquidity pool and the price of Adam goes up a lot relative to the other asset in the um, pool, I'm not going to get back as much Adam as I put in. Because what happens is, is when the price of Adam goes up, the ratio gets off. So the, the arbitrage, arbitrageurs <laughs> and the AMM they buy and sell to fix that ratio. And so when I pull my 1% out at the end, I'm going to get back likely 
fewer atoms and more osmo in this particular example. Now, the value, if, if the value of Cosmo or Atom went up 5x, I'm still going to make money. But this impermanent loss idea is the difference between the amount of profit I would make uh, participating in the liquidity pool versus what would I have earned if I just held the assets in a wallet somewhere. And that's, it's almost like an opportunity cost idea. Like how much yield could I earn or how much profit could I earn in one situation versus how much profit could I earn in another situation? So in permanent loss, the word loss is a little bit misleading because I don't want to think you, it means like you're going to be in the negative. It's just the difference between what you could earn in one scenario versus what you could earn in another scenario. There are times where that difference could be substantial and it could make more sense in some cases to just hold the asset if you expect like a dramatic like bull run where things are going to go up a ton. Um, and it's an asset that you're really bullish on and you would not want to lose any of them, there are going to be cases where holding it is is a better strategy than participating in an AMM. But if the price is going to be relatively stable, maybe some volatility, but nothing like 5x changes, then you make money off the yield. So it can the math can work out and that the impact of impermanent loss is small relative to one, the price appreciation, and two, the yield that you earn from participating. You're also participating in an ecosystem that needs liquidity. So if nobody participates, then there aren't going to be DeFi exchanges. So there is that side of it as well, that if you want to help the ecosystem grow by contributing your liquidity, you help it survive and thrive. And the more participants there are in a, a DeFi exchange, the more stable it is. You don't really want you know, one whale controlling the whole thing, because if that one whale decides to leave, then it kind of ruins it for everybody else. Uh, so in permanent loss, and there's a bunch of online calculators. If you Google in permanent loss calculator, you'll get a bunch of them up. So you can kind of see different scenarios. The tricky thing for me when I was doing this is like, I don't know how much it's going to go up. So you have to make this decision in advance of you know any potential price increases. So you can calculate the impermanent loss theoretically, uh, but it's not that easy to make a decision about whether to participate based on the likelihood of it going up 5x, because I don't really know if it's going to go up 5x. Now, if it goes up 5x, you're still going to make money either way. You're just going to make a little bit less. But this is where you have to balance it out with how much would you have made versus in the yield versus how much would you have made um, and how much are you losing from the liquidity pool rebalancing. So it gets a little bit complicated. And I, in this sort of lesson, I'm, I'm not trying to teach you exactly how to do all of that. I'm simply going over what is impermanent loss because it comes up a lot and it's not always explained that clearly. And it, it's sort of positioned as this risk. But if you don't really understand what the risk is, how can you make a smart decision about what to do? So I like the idea of these decentralized exchanges. It kind of gives the power to the people and we kind of control our own financial ecosystem. And if no one participates, then they don't exist. So I like the idea of participating. However, just be aware that if you... You know, when I was doing it, I was like buying assets like for this purpose, knowing that some of them would go up. When people have asked me about my XRP, like what I put my XRP in a liquidity pool, I just have a very different like viewpoint on that particular asset. And the idea of, of dealing with impermanent loss on XRP uh, affects me a little bit differently than it would assets that I went out and bought for this purpose. That might not make any sense and I might be too like attached to XRP. I'm just sort of sharing why uh, I have any, I mean, I don't think there are any, I don't know of any DeFi exchanges where you can put XRP in a liquidity pool. I know that's one of the things that's been discussed to come to the XRPL. So I haven't had to make that decision just yet because it hasn't been an option. So we'll see. But this really is the future of finance not only amongst sort of retail people like us using tools like Uniswap and SushiSwap, but the institutional finance world would benefit greatly. I mean, they would be trading 24 seven. It's all kind of done via automated you know, smart contracts. So you could have these global exchanges where they trade things around the clock and you're no longer sort of in the you know, nine to four or whatever the New York Stock Exchange hours are. And you've got the, to you know, the Tokyo hours and the London hours. This would really dramatically accelerate the rate of 
uh, exchanges around the globe because it would be this thing that runs 24 seven. And because we have NFTs uh, that can be used to um, verify your credentials, you know, institutional traders can have their own DeFi exchanges that are kind of a walled garden. Now, I'm not advocating for people to be excluded from anything, but I do know that certain financial markets uh, only allow trading with people who either work at certain companies or have certain criteria, qualifications or whatever. So that DeFi can still work for the institutional world is my long way of making that point. But when you decide whether or not to participate in a DeFi exchange, also known as an AMM, automated market maker, it is important that you understand what are liquidity pools, what are you actually doing or agreeing to when you put your money into a liquidity pool, you are buying a share of it. And so when you pull your funds out, you're very likely not going to get back the ex exact number of assets that you put in. You also, in many, many cases, have to put in two, at least two assets in a certain ratio. And that represents the share of the liquidity pool that you buy. And then when you go to withdraw your funds at a certain point, you're going to get whatever that ratio is at the time, um, which is probably going to be different if there's been any price appreciation. Now, some exchanges, I mean, this kind of happened around when the bear market started. Some exchanges were starting to offer insurance against impermanent loss, especially for um, assets that people are like very bullish on long term. So at the time when I first learned about the insurance idea, it was with Thor block Thor or something that was kind of tied into the Luna blockchain, which is all, I don't even know what's going on over there anymore. Probably just totally done. Anyway, uh, people who are very uh, bullish on Bitcoin could get insurance on their Bitcoin against impermanent loss as a way to encourage them to participate in the DeFi exchange um, and not having to be fearful or worried about losing their Bitcoin. So it is very possible on the XRP ledger that someone could offer an insurance against impermanent loss in case this was something you were worried about and it was worth it to you. And I don't think there was a cost to the insurance. It just, you had to commit to a certain amount of time. So for example, if you agreed to put your XRP, for example, into an AMM on the XRP ledger for a minimum of like, I'm making up the number, like 60 days or something, and you could then get this insurance against impermanent loss. It, I, my take is that that was an incentive, one, to participate, but two, to they want long-term liquidity providers and they don't really want people pulling their money in and out and changing the value of the pools on a regular basis. If you ever do participate in a liquidity pool, it's also advised that you want there to be a lot of participants in there and a lot of liquidity so that if one person pulled out, the whole pool doesn't really collapse. I was never in a pool that quote, quote collapsed because like a whale pulled out all their funds and didn't enable it. But I was sort of warned early on when I was learning about this to make sure you pick big pools with lots of participants so that you don't have that risk. Um, you're also going to need to understand the difference between APR, annual percentage rate, and APY. They kind of look alike, but they're not really. One is essentially the compounded interest of taking any profits and reinvesting them back into your pool. And so a lot of DeFi exchanges would promote the APY looking like it's this incredibly high number that you're going to make all this money, but it really was a compounded rate. And you would earn yield daily. In some cases, there was one they were doing it three times a day. So you could earn these crazy, crazy high percentages. But just be aware, I kind of learned this the hard way. If the numbers sound too good to be true, they very likely are. And you're dealing with an ecosystem that's very fragile and growing and new and could be a bit of a vaporware environment. Because um, a lot of times these tokens, especially during 2021, were going up so much in value, but there really wasn't any utility to them. So people were buying them and investing them for yield, but that can't be the only reason that somebody uses these assets is to invest for yield. It's one of the reasons I love sort of the X world of XRP, XLM, XDC, et cetera, these utility tokens is that aside from any kind of speculative investing, they actually solve an important problem in the market. They have utility and people would buy them and use them for reasons that have nothing to do with speculative investing. And so if we start to get the ability to earn yield on utility assets, that's super cool because now there's multiple reasons why somebody would want to own them. So, all right, there's your lesson in a permanent loss. And if you have any questions, ask me in the comments. I also have a Twitter thread that I wrote on this. I'll put the link in the description and you can check that out as well.